<laughs> wow, what a treat. Hello, hello. What's up? How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm being I'm being commandeered. I see this. What a what a who is this man in the background? Let's see. <laughs> the Look whitest, at you. The whitest brown man ever. <laughs> that's true. My mom is a disco queen from Connecticut, so that's where I get my white boyness from. All right, I'll let you two have at it. <laughs> thanks. What thanks. a guy. What a guy. <laughs> <laughs> my yeah mic, my face. how are you i'm good how are you i'm good i'm doing well thank you for hopping on and clearing up your schedule a bit no problem i'm excited yeah i'm I'm still new to podcasts so every time oh. somebody's like would you like to do a podcast i'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> it's like dipping your foot into the water a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah i'm like i don't know what i'm gonna say but you can <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> here's here's a candid. I have no idea what I'm going to say most of the time. <laughs> I kind of gathered that. I listened to a couple of your podcasts and I was like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very chill, low key. And uh, yeah, usually I just like to shoot the shit and whatever we talk about, we talk about. I like to know also um, what kind of a filter do I have to have walking into these? <laughs> well, feel free to drop drop your fucks, your shits, and uh, be yourself, AK. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay, we're good. We got the green light. We're good. That's right. <laughs> we got the green light. <laughs> What'd you say? No, no. All right. <laughs> uh, so why don't why don't we give a little? I like your mug too, by the way. <laughs> You fucker. <laughs> yep. For the people who can't see it, it That's says right. have a nice day. And on the bottom, there's a middle finger. <laughs> it's really what everybody's trying to say. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Well, why don't we why don't we hop down memory lane a little bit? Right. So why don't we go over, you know, who you are, a little bit of, of your story, and then uh I'm sure I'll have a shit ton of questions after that. Sure. So uh, back in February 12th of 1992, I was born. <laughs> You're 92? Wow. Yeah. I'm older than you. Okay, yeah. here we go. <laughs> Woo. That's right. That does surprise a lot of people. They think I'm in my 20s. But uh, no, I mean, um, I mean, where do you want to start? You want to start work career, athletic career? February where do we want to go? February 12th, 1992. <laughs> it was a cold day Both in Michigan. It was. Yeah, maybe that's where we start. All right. So uh, I am 32 years old, if you can't do math. I was born in Michigan, and I moved to San Diego, California. It'll be two years in just a few days, actually. Wow. In five days, it will be my two-year anniversary. Wow! What are you? What so, are your thoughts? And we'll we'll take it there because I had my one-year anniversary on February 9th. January, and you. So, what are your thoughts on San Diego so far? Coming from another cold climate to now, and let me just chug my gallon of water as you do that. Oh my gosh! <laughs> he <Excuse> literally <laughs> literally has a gallon of water. Excuse me. Um, okay. So first moving out here, coming from, from the Midwest, um, everybody was telling me how much I was going to hate it. They're like, you're yeah. not going to like the people. Uh, you're not going to, I, I also am a farm girl. I never lived mm. on a farm, but I rode horses from the time I was nine until I was, tw well, until a year, almost two years ago. Mm. So until I was 30. So, wow. Yeah. But like, it was a big part of my life. I practically lived on the farm. I managed a farm. So mm -hmm. being a farm girl, they're like, you're going to hate the city. The traffic is horrible. <laughs> and um, once I got out here, any complaints that I may have had were washed away by the copious amounts of sunshine. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I actually love it. And um, I have no problem with, I don't know what everyone was talking about that I'm not going to like the people out here. I love the people out here. The weather's mm, great. Yeah. It does it does rain more than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> but I like the rain. I sleep well in the rain, so That's I right. don't complain about it. And it's necessary because it, it doesn't happen often, not compared mm -hmm. to Midwest. Right. Um, but California is awesome. If yeah, you get the yeah. chance to live out here, even if it's temporary, I say do it. Yeah. 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 Cost of living's higher, but so is your pay and yeah um for people like us i mean we make our own income so we need yeah. more money we have a way to find it right so. absolutely well i think it's funny because uh i think that is such like a small because i've i heard similar things uh before i moved to new york city about how like oh like people are different like 
tons of traffic like it's totally different life and they're not wrong right but it's also like i feel like san Di san diego is way different than most like major cities because it's just it has it has yes there's a downtown city but there's also so many other places you can go in the area that that aren't even close to like a city life yeah no it's i like it i have no yeah complaints other yeah than being apart from my family but no complaints about that's the hardest part and that is yeah the hardest part yeah and then traveling across the country to go visit yep Ugh. <laughs> it's, uh, i know i know and it's fun it's such like uh and i agree that is the hardest part because it's i mean you you seem like someone who's very close to your family too so i think it's uh i'm and i'm very very similar so it's always tough and i think you just had an, a nephew right Yeah, in August. Yeah, so that's Yep. even harder. I know. And I'm like, I don't want to be that aunt that's like, oh, I, I have an aunt who lives in California. Yeah. I, I, every time I see him, I'm like, I'm the cool aunt. That's Not right. because I live in California, but I'm Yep, the cool aunt. that's right. Because I'm just a cool person, right? Yeah. You got to get to know That's me, right. man. Get to know me, man. Take some time, man. Let's He's just like, get you're this. here twice a year. Come out my way. We'll shred some gnar. That's right. You're welcome to stay at auntie's house anytime you want. Just making, propagating the stereotypes. That's right. Oops. <laughs> well, But okay. So let's keep going. <laughs> I sure. need to hear Okay. a good story. So, so back in 1992, That's right. no, um, I did move out to California. Um, love it here. Would not change it for the world. Back when I was in Michigan, I was working 40 hours a week in physical therapy. I'm a physical therapy assistant. And um, as much as I loved the job, corporate healthcare is bullshit and it has way too many flaws. And um, I just saw a lot of gaps in the healthcare system that I felt I could fill Mm. and insurance companies and corporate healthcare wouldn't allow me to. So Yeah. I kind of started a side gig in Michigan, just helping. I was, I was doing, I was coaching CrossFit at the time. Mm. So a lot of the CrossFit athletes were injured, needed help. I would help them. And Yeah. when I moved to California, I decided this is a fresh start. I'm basically being given a reset button on my life. I hated working 40 hours a week in a corporate setting, feeling like I could provide more, but being told I wasn't allowed to. So I started my LLC and um, being a PTA, I can't practice physical therapy independently. Mm. So I don't do physical therapy. I do consulting. People come to me with their problems. We chat about it. Yeah. I might do some hands-on work with them. That's actually mostly what I do is the hands-on part because it Mm feels hmm. good. And that's what Yeah. people want. Yeah. But along the way, I'm really trying to educate people on how to take care of themselves and prevent injury and live to their fullest potential, whether that's a daily life thing or a sport thing. So Yeah. I started my LLC and that's what I do now. Um, I'm still working contingent for a physical therapy clinic. They'll call me once every couple of months, but Mm -hmm. my income is my business, man. And I'm so Yeah. fortunate because I get to create my own schedule and I Yeah. work part-time so that the other part-time for me, I don't get paid for it, but I do consider it my job. I take it that seriously is the Olympic weightlifting that I do. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you're, you're so, so I, I like that. Cause there's, there's like a dichotomy to you, right? So there's a person who's almost like the healer side, right. Who wants to help you move, be mobile, um, do the hands-on work. And then there's also like this badass, uh, like Olympic weightlifter side of you. When did, so if we, if we fast forward from 1992, when did, cause I know you're coaching CrossFit. When did you start getting into Olympic weightlifting? And then when were you like, Holy shit, I'm pretty good at this. Let's see where it goes. So, gosh, okay, you're really going to make me rewind here. <laughs> it's your story, baby. So if it's, if it's, okay, well, this is a, here's a fun fact that a lot of people don't know about me. And when they find out their like jaw hits the floor. So I said, I'm 32, right? I've been Olympic weightlifting, only Olympic weightlifting, like dedicated to it for four years now. So I started when I was 28, Wow. but it gets, it gets even better. Cool. I did not step foot into a gym until I was 21 years old. Wow. A little bit, little bit of a late bloomer. Yeah. And um, when I started, all I knew how to use was the treadmill. So, All right. That's good. <laughs> so I ran three miles a day, three times a week. And I did that for like a year. And I think at my smallest, I was like 148 pounds. Mm. Yeah. And for, for reference, I'm 170 pounds now. Um, Mm hmm. 
So I packed on some mass over the years, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was probably around 2015 that I got my uh, CrossFit coaching certification. Mm. And when I started CrossFit, that's when I realized how much I loved the barbell. Mm. So after a year of dabbling in CrossFit, I went straight powerlifting and I did competitive powerlifting for two years. Uh Um, That's possibly another fun fact that I don't talk about often, but year one, I did a very small federation. It was called APA. And I went to the world championships and I won. Wow. (laughs) Quite the rookie year. (laughs) Then the next year I went uh, to a slightly larger federation, AAPF, and same thing, went to world championships and won. Wow. And then I dropped out of powerlifting competitively to finish school. And once I was done with school, I wanted to do something competitive again. And that's Mm -hmm. when I was like, okay, let's, we've done powerlifting. Let's try Olympic weightlifting. Mm -hmm. And Actually, what got me hooked on it is the fact that I wasn't that great at it. I was strong, Mm. but powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting are so different for so many reasons. And um, powerlifting, there is technique, but it's a lot more strength-based. You can Mm. really kind of muscle those lifts. Yeah. Olympic weightlifting, you can only muscle it to a certain point and it Mm. hard stops at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And I pretty much was at that point. Like I was super strong. I would walk into an Olympic weightlifting gym and people were like, you're a freak of nature. Why are you so strong? (laughs) They'd scream freak, freak. (laughs) Pretty much. And I just wave. Hey, hey." (laughs) meathead over here. (laughs) Um, but, uh, it was once I hit that, like that hard stopping point, Mm -hmm. it just became a mission of like, how do I get around this? Mm -hmm. How do I get that meat head side of me wanted more weight on the bar. And I had to find a way to achieve it through technique instead of Mm -hmm. muscling it. So it became a serious addiction. Um, But another, another big difference too, is the distribution of weight in your foot In powerlifting, you're a little bit more midfoot and heel based. In mm. Olympic weightlifting, you're definitely more midfoot and forefoot because mm. you need to be able to hit that triple extension. You need to be in the forefoot kind of ready for a jump. Mm. So getting me off of my heels was probably all I worked on for the first two years. Wow. And it was yeah. so, it was so hard. I'm still working probably on it. It feels so awkward. A hundred percent. That's yeah. my first Olympic weightlifting coach actually used to tell me, you know, I'd hit a lift and I'm like, that felt really weird. And he goes, good. That's because you did it right. (laughs) If it feels foreign, it took you out of your bad habits and you're Mm. doing it right. So yeah, it's kind of been this, this up and down pathway, um, with a lot of tangents in the middle, but solid Olympic weightlifting for four years now. I I feel like it, like not only does it appeal to like the meathead side of you, like how can I get more weight on the bar? But also, I also feel like it's because your first two years in powerlifting, you were like, this is easy, right? Like I'm a, I just win every time I do this, but when it came, yeah, that's serious though. That's real. I, um, I just, I just said there was a lot of tangents along the way. So powerlifting for two years, world championships twice, won both federations. Um, I might still have some state or world records. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I should, I should, or not world. Um, no, they were world records. See, I can't even remember. I was just a baby. I was just <laughs> so a strong, <laughs> a strong little baby. Like, I should check into that. But um, it's that farm work, baby. It's that it, farm. <laughs> dude, do you know how much a, a good hay bale weighs? Those things are like seventy-five pounds, and twelve-year-old wow. me is just, just chucking clean, them, just snatching them. <laughs> yeah, do my snatch. Um, but there was also there were a few more tangents. Um, I'll, just going back to what you were saying about yeah. how. Olympic weightlifting was the first time I had to fight for something. And I, I mm. learned to love that fight. I had also done along the way, um, one training cycle of strongman, went to this oh. competition. I won cool. and then I, I qualified for nationals and I, I hated the training process of strongman. It was mm. mo- too monotonous for me. So I quit. Yeah. And I think my coach could have killed me. Yeah. 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 It's like you just qualified for nationals. You could have been the strongest woman in the world. <laughs> I'm like, Man, no, thanks. <laughs> Um, and then I've also done Brazilian jiu-jitsu cool. and, um, I never surpassed a white belt, but I did go to my first tournament as a white belt and I won both my gi and no gi matches. <laughs> so it was just like, it, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. It's fun to yeah. win, but I, it was this, this, this challenge of having to fight yeah. for something was yeah. new to me and I hated it, but I yeah. liked it. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it makes like I said, it makes so much sense because it's like one you you're kind of even though you started at 21, you're kind of like a natural athlete, right? Or natural strength athlete. And then when you face this challenge of I've I'm not that great at Olympic weightlifting and I feel like a fucking deer like doing this clean and snatch, right? And I think that's that I think that says a lot about your character too, because it could have it could have you could have very easily stayed within those two sports, right? And excelled at it and reached the mountaintop or, you know, very quickly reach it. And then it kind of speaks to your character how you're like, no, I want to work harder for this. I want to learn from this and I want to you know, earn it in a different way, right? A hundred percent. There's actually, I'm going to get cheesy for a second. Please do. There, <laughs> there's a an artist named NF, the letter N. The oh, letter I love F. NF. Yeah. Okay. I'm yep. obsessed with him too. You know yeah. his song, uh, Grindin'? Yeah. There's a, there's a lyric or a, a phrase in that song where he says, um, I don't care about the top, leave me at the bottom, let me work for it. Yeah. And like, when I heard that song, I, I like... I would blast that in my car yep. on the way to training, <laughs> just on repeat because yep. I lo- I just resonated with mm-hmm. that. Like, oh yeah, I want to fight for it. I want to earn it because when you do earn it, it just tastes so much better. Yeah, and there's so much pride in that, mm-hmm. and um, just the discipline aspect of it. Yeah, I don't know. I like it. It's yeah. good stuff. Oh, it is good. <laughs> That's good, good stuff, right? There. Good stuff. <laughs> that tastes pretty good. <laughs> Almost as good as this coffee. That's right. <laughs> is there competitive coffee drinking? I don't know. If I've any of your listeners know, find me on Instagram at Demo Wellness. Yep. Let me know. <laughs> I want to be a competitive coffee because I will drink everything. <laughs> If I come on your podcast again, you're going to have your gallon of water. That's right. I'm going to have a gallon of coffee. Of coffee. <laughs> yes. And then I'll meet you at the emergency room later on that day. Man, I'm what happened exploded. to your adrenal glands? Why. Yeah, that's right. I'm having heart palpitations. <laughs> she I said she kept them in the same NF line. I, I don't understand. She wanted to be at the bottom. But... <laughs> I think she's hit rock bottom. That's right. Yeah, I think she's there. <laughs> she earned it. It tastes better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think the cool part is to... It, and I guess I should ask you this, because you you basically start off in the gym as like a cardio bunny, right? Like you're yeah. doing three miles every for three days. And I think a lot of women can relate to that, too, because I think, you know, a lot of and a lot of women, I think, stay on the treadmill. Right. So yeah. I think what was kind of your well, let, let, let me see what these weights are all about or like what was kind of like your moment for that? Like what got you off the treadmill? Okay. So I'm laughing because this is, I'm actually so glad you brought this up. So yes, three miles a day, three times a week. That was all I knew how to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, at, I remember back then feeling, and remember this was a decade ago, but I remember back then just feeling like as a woman in the gym, Mm -hmm. almost like I didn't belong in the weights area. Yeah. Um, and, and not, necessarily like a a sexist way but like I didn't know what I was doing and I was scared Mm. to be embarrassed or judged or look silly um and you you should see me now Mm -hmm. the things I do in the gym the grunter (laughs) all sorts of sounds um but even just to the point of like not being scared to try things I do the weirdest stuff in the gym it's part of my job but yeah anyways um I at the time was dating a guy who had formerly competed in powerlifting. Mm. And he was like, I'm telling you just by your levers, the way you're built, like you'd be so good at lifting. (laughs) And the reason I'm so excited that you asked this question, 10 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I would have told you, I remember this conversation. I I told him over and over and over. I said, listen, I don't want to get too big. Yeah. I don't want to get too big. I was so scared that weights were going to make me big. Mm -hmm. And I also said, I don't want to get hurt. I was scared to get hurt lifting weights. Mm -hmm. And um, just after enough pushing, he convinced me, oh, he got, that's right. He got certified CrossFit. So he's became a CrossFit coach. And he's like, why don't you just try CrossFit? It's still kind of cardio ish, which you're comfortable with and you like, Mm -hmm. and there will be a coach there to teach you how to do new movements and Mm -hmm. you'll learn a lot. And I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of in the middle. Like I won't look like a fool. Somebody's basically there with me teaching me. Um, but it was. The, the CrossFit gym I was at at the time, we did a um, CrossFit total once a month. 
which is way too frequent. Don't don't <laughs> test don't test your max One out once max. a month. <laughs> but that was what we did. We tested our um deadlift, back squat, and strict press once a month. And I remember the first month I did it, I had no idea what I could squat, right? I had been doing <clears throat> maybe, I think we were doing like five sets of 10 at 135 pounds. And I did that for like a year mm. <laughs> because again, he would be like, it's time to put more weight on. And I'm like, no, yeah. no, no. I don't want to get too big. I don't want to yeah. get too, I don't want to get hurt. So I had a year of a base built up. We went to do this, this, uh, max out. And I one repped 275. <laughs> I had never squatted more than 135 pounds. And I hit 275. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing it up and racking it. And I was like, oh, shit. I want more. Oh, like, wow. we we just opened up a can of, like, just to, tapped into this, like, beast side. And it just, mm -hmm. I was so impressed with myself. Not high on myself, but, like, in awe. Yeah. I was like, a, a body can do that. Mm. And then it just became like, what, what the fuck else can I do? Right. And that was when I was like, I want to compete in powerlifting. Mm. Give me the barbell. Give me a strength training program. Yeah. I don't care what I look like. I aesthetics went out the window. Mm. Like there was no fear of being bulky. There was no fear of having too much muscle. I didn't, yeah. that wasn't even a thought. Aesthetics wasn't a thought. It was simply performance. I was like, how strong can I get? Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it changed me. I think, I think yeah, like how you're laughing. It's like, you can just put yourself in that moment. But I think it's, I think what you said is, a, it's really important for, I think, any person here, but more importantly, woman to hear is that once you, once you can see what a body can do and, and, and really see what strength looks like in a different way and, and I, and I like what you said too, where it be like, as soon as that moment happened, like you, you could care less about your aesthetics. It was more like, no. how does this body move? What else can this body do? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it, the funny thing is too, like, I'm sure everybody in the world has heard this numerous times, but like mm -hmm. once I stopped caring about the aesthetics and I started focusing on the performance, the yeah. aesthetics came along with it. Yep. And I've had my ups and downs, especially like powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, uh, jujitsu, strongman, all of those sports, you have a weight class to compete mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And I've changed weight classes. So I've gone up, I've gone down, but, um, aesthetics wise, like I'm, I'm really happy with where I'm at. It's not yeah. a focus of mine, but I'm, I'm content with what this body looks like and what it can do. Right. And it's funny because sometimes I do get people asking me, um, like depending on where I'm at in my training season, I, I might have abs Yeah. and people are like, well, what do you do to train abs? And I'm like, not a single thing. I don't do right. one crunch ever. Right. Nothing. I don't, I don't, none of that. Right. I lift, especially in Olympic weightlifting, putting a barbell overhead that really challenges that six pack muscle, mm -hmm. um, to prevent you from folding backwards essentially. Right. So it's just, it's just so funny how, when you really focus on the performance and the output and what, like you said, what your body can do and pushing the limits. Yeah. The, the aesthetics come secondhand. Yeah, they really do. They're, they're almost like, we're here now to show you that what you're yeah. doing is cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, the second you stopped caring about me, I decided right. to come to the party. It's a party, baby. Yeah. <laughs> here comes that bicep vein. It's <laughs> So basically eat all the cheeseburgers you want. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Do heavy squats <laughs> and you'll look like a goddess. That's right. Well, I think, and I think it's so true too, because I, I feel like, because you and I are the same age, I feel like we grew up in an era, especially I can remember in like high school, um, I feel like women maybe just started going to the gym, but it, even in my school, it was more like only athletes were there and they weren't even really pushing them to do like heavy weights or um like the stuff that that we were doing on the football team so i feel like from our era like seeing women in gyms is just like now it's like such a normal thing right yeah that definitely has changed i mean um another fun fact i didn't do mm -hmm. any sports in school none yeah just horseback just riding. farming <laughs> yep, just, farming just farm life <laughs> um so I was never actually in like the weight room at my high school or anything, mm -hmm. but I do remember like, 
like the cheerleading team, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think I, I don't think they were ever in the weight room. They would right. have their practices and they might be doing calisthenic type stuff in the gymnasium, mm-hmm. but they were never in the weight room. And now, um, my Olympic weightlifting coach actually helps coach at one of the local high schools. And it's like, there's, cool. there's boys and girls in there, like yeah, how it should be, you know, yeah, yeah. especially And again, most people probably know this, but like strength training for women is so important, especially Mm -hmm. as we age, like we're more prone to osteoporosis. And how do you increase bone density with resistance training? Yeah. So it's like, heck yeah, girl, get your butt in the gym. Go grab some dumbbells. Like get your groove on, take up space. That's my new favorite saying. Take up space. (laughs) I'll be in the gym like, hey, bro, how many more sets you got on that press? Box me out. (laughs) Can I just jump in with you? We're going to need right. a few more plates. <laughs> You're deadlifting that? That's usually what I clean, but uh, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I would I would never. I would never I do that. <laughs> but I think, never. I, I, and I, that's what I love about it, too, because they're like integrating kids into strength training at an early age. I think I think we're going to see, like my prediction is all these kids that are getting into it now sooner – I think they're going to have a much better relationship with exercise and, um, you know, better, I, I think better health factors in terms of like strength training and all these benefits that they come with it compared to, like I said, when we were younger, where it was more like just guys are in the gym for, for sports training. And, and that's it. Like, like I said, like going in the gym now, it, it's night and day difference. It's like, it's like, I would say it's like mostly women that are like strength training, um, and then obviously you have the, the group of guys, but I, I think that's the really cool part is, um, you know, women are now seeing that. And I think examples like people like you and, and other women who, who are showing like, Hey, you can be strong as fuck. Doesn't necessarily mean this is going to bulk you unless that's your goal. Right. It, it's like, yeah, this is really a good thing for you in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And like, um, if you follow any, any sports, right. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll just stick with uh, what I'm familiar with, right. Olympic weightlifting. We have this athlete. She's insane. She's most likely going to the Olympics coming up. Um, I believe she's 19. She's 19. And our former, I just saw this yesterday, actually our former team USA Olympian, um, Kate Vibert just, reviewed one of her recent performances where she was competing against this up and coming 19 year old Olivia Reeves. And she says, it's incredible to be competing side by side with somebody who Mm -hmm. I consider to be the greatest woman Olympic weightlifter of all time. Our former Olympic team USA silver medal Olympian said that about this up and coming 19 year old. And it's so true. So like I look at my coach and I'm like, man, I know we're trying to make it in this sport, but I'm 32 and my clock <laughs> yeah, is ticking. Right. And there's kids working in gyms in high school right now, building this foundation. Yeah. And if they decide to go into any sort of a professional sport, they're going to be unstoppable. Like yep. I can't wait to watch the next decade of sports yes. and see what comes out because mm-hmm. we're going to be seeing some, you can't even call them genetic freaks. Like they have worked for it. Right. And it's just, it's incredible to see this shift and this change. And it's yep. sports is going to be intense over the next oh, yeah. decade or two. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because like whenever you see people like debate about like older athletes and saying like, oh, how like, <laughs> hey. it's just, a, or, but even like old, like, like Hall of Fame, like, well, and, like I'm thinking about football, like you think of like Hall of Fame players, like from back in the day, and then you compare like their routine and how they looked and what they did back then to athletes now it's like, of course, records are being broken. Like, of like someone just ran and at the NFL combine just happened last weekend. The previous record was like a forty yard dash was four point two two seconds, and someone just broke it at four point two one. So it's like that. Like people are just gonna keep getting faster. People are gonna keep getting strong as hell. You're gonna see, you know, pe- like evolution, right? I think that's the cool thing. It's like now that now that we've caught up our um, education and and um, getting over these stigmas and stereotypes of st- what strength training does for women or anything like that, you know, now that it starts at a much younger age, like like that's yeah. like saying like we're thirty two. Imagine if we knew what we do then, it'd be like we'd be we'd be freaks in our own right, right? It's like, it's I say like, that all the time. I'm like, why yeah. did I 
why did I wait to start lifting until yeah. I was 24? Why did I wait to go into a gym until I was 21? Like, right. I mean, if I had started in yeah. some, even anything like gymnastics, right. soccer, something, yep. but I was like, no, I'm just going to saddle up my heart. That's right. A simple for a life, little, really. A little roll, <laughs> get my straw hat. Take I the horse on a ride now. <laughs> realistically, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I think yeah. that's, that's what taught me, um, kind of circling back to what we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. like how I, I like, I like the challenge. I like working yeah. for something. I think that actually... It came from my farm days. There you go. Yeah. Well, I think, and again, I, I think that's that's a good thing too, because it, it also, you can't, like people are, might be at a different place uh, aesthetically and strength-wise at a younger age, but I think there's certain things we, we've we done in life or lessons we've learned in life that have made us strong in different ways, right? And totally. like, like you said, you might not even try this shit if you didn't even do um, like horse riding back in the day or, or like have that time to focus on something else other than just weight training all the time. Right. Cause, cause I'm sure even you like competing for this sport all the time, like that being your only goal, that, that could be draining too. Oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I actually, um, I actually almost quit last year, mm. Th- this time last year, I was in this lull motivation was out. Mm-hmm which that's normal. That's going to happen. Motivation is not always there. And that's when they say discipline comes in. Right. Right. I was, I was staying disciplined and I was going, but Oh man, I I was getting bitter. Yeah. And I straight up, I sat down with my coach and I was like, I don't think I love this anymore. Mm. And it took us probably a month or so to figure out like everything that was going on. But, um, we circled back and obviously we're still here. Yeah. But yeah, motivation is not always there, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, and I think that's a good point too, because, um, when motivation's gone, discipline remains, but I think there, there's also that factor too, where it's like, when you start resenting what you're doing or you create, like, like you said, like that bitterness towards it, I think there there's all, that's also sort of a sign for some people. And I know you, you were able to sort of, um, rejuvenate it to get back into it, to focus on it more. But I think that's also a sign for some people that like, Hey, like, try something new too, right? Like you, that's what you did, right? When, so when you started to be curious about something else or were getting bored of something or anything like, like you tried something new, I think that's totally okay for people to understand too. A hundred percent. And I actually tried, um, mentioning that with my coach. I'm like, maybe, mm-hmm. I don't know, man, am I getting bored? Like, do I need to do a CrossFit class here and there just to do something different? Yeah. And, um, the, I, I think that's a good piece of advice for general population, right? Like if mm-hmm. you're just going to the gym to try and be healthy and move and you feel like you're kind of in this rut, motivation's low, you're starting yeah. to kind of resent what you're doing in the process and it's not fulfilling anymore. That's not going to last. So you have mm-hmm. to assess why. And for general population, I think a lot of times what you just said is accurate. Like maybe you need to switch it up. Yeah. Maybe you're still going to the same gym, but you're switching up the way your workout splits are, or you're mm-hmm. adding in cardio because you weren't before, or right. you're taking more active rest days and doing more walks or hikes. Like yeah. that stuff works for general population. Mm-hmm. The problem that we had was <clears throat> we're trying to compete at the highest level possible. Right. So my coach was like, what are your goals? And I'm like, well, if it is possible before I'm an old hag, I would love to, you know, make it to the Olympics. Yeah. And he's like, okay, you want to go to the Olympics. You don't have time, especially at 32 to go dabble in other things. Mm. He's like, every ounce of effort has to go towards your goals. Right. So you're either going to stick it out or you're not. So we had to dive down and dig a lot deeper into what my, my issues were with the process. And Mm. luckily we were able to like figure that out. Um, Yeah. But I do think that's a very sound piece of advice for anybody who's not chasing some, some bigger goal. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, and I think that what you just said too is important for people to understand is, uh, if you don't dig deep, I, and I think that's even great for for general population is like digging deeper is always a good thing because it could be that you like a lot of people just program hop right or they'll just keep trying different things and like we said for the for the person who's like i'm just trying to be healthy and have fun and try things like that's cool you're good yeah right totally for somebody yeah absolutely for somebody who maybe 
has a discipline issue, then digging deeper is definitely a good thing to do because it might uncover the reason why you keep trying something new or like maybe it's an education thing. Maybe it's a um, sort of maybe like something that deep rooted when you're growing up or anything like that. Like th there's so many reasons why uh, someone might lose motivation and then say, fuck it, and then go on to something else. Right. So I think yeah, digging deep is a good thing. And I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the down low on what we had to dig into Take the wheel. Um, because I think it's actually going to be relevant and helpful to other people. Mm. So we had to dig. I knew, mo I know motivation comes and goes. Yeah. So I wasn't riding on that. I, like I said, I was riding on discipline and I know I'm disciplined. So after about a month and a half, two months of keeping my discipline, but going and hating it. And mm. every day it got worse and worse. Like to the point, it was almost like a, like a toxic thing for me to go. Like yeah. I dreaded going, I was cranky there. I would have a bad workout. It would ruin my day. Mm. I would come home. My partner would be like, what's wrong. And eventually he was like, listen, you're not the right person. Like not the right person. You're not the person you used to be. I've seen a shift in you and mm. it's, Im it's impacting your life at this point. Mm. So sat down with my coach and this took, like I said, it took us almost a month of conversations and figuring it out a month, right? This wasn't like we sat down and we were like, oh, an hour of discussion gave us this light bulb moment. Right. No, we had to break shit down. And ultimately what it came down to, and this is, this is where I think a lot of people maybe need to hear this. It was yeah. my expectations. Mm. My expectations were off on what yeah. I thought I deserved based on the amount of work I had put in. Mm. So like I just said, you know, my coach is like, what's your ultimate goal? And it's like, well, I mean, shit, if we can Olympics, if not, at least an international level where I can represent team USA. Yeah. And he said, okay, how long have you been doing this sport? And I'm like, at the time, you know, three years, he goes, okay, who are you comparing yourself to? And I'm like, well, Kate and I, Olivia Reeves, Maddie Rogers, you know, the top names in Olympic weightlifting. Mm. And then he goes, great. How long have they been doing it? And I'm like, well, you know, eight, nine years. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, so twice as long as you. Yeah. And he said, what, no offense, what makes you think that you're special? Mm. He goes, don't get me wrong. To a degree, you're you're talented. You're special. Yeah. He said, but why on earth would you think that you're going to be in the same place as these Olympians who worked for a decade mm. and you've only been working for three years? Yeah. And it was kind of like, huh, yeah, like, wow, that's not only unrealistic expectation of me, but like, what a um, discredit to them. Yeah. Like I have just discredited how long and how hard they have worked for mm. just assuming I would get there. Right. And, and then we had to ask ourselves, why, why was I feeling that way? And it really circled back to what we talked about earlier. Mm. First year powerlifting world championships. One. Yep. Second year, Harder Federation, World Championships, won. Right. Jiu-Jitsu, won my, both my tournaments. Right. Strong man, qualified for nationals. So it's like I had been strong and that had almost been like a give me mm -hmm. in, in competing that I would do well. So to hop into a sport that I knew was challenging me and the reason that I fell in love with it all of a sudden became the reason I hated it. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> it it all of a sudden became the reason I hated it. Yeah. But it was all because of my expectations. Mm. Once we sat down and we talked about what a realistic timeline looks for me, the question he asked me, he asked me two things. He said, picture your life without weightlifting and how do you feel about it? Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, I hate it. Yeah. Like I'm going to crawl into a dark hole. And he goes, okay, so you still love the sport. It's not that you hate the sport. You think you hate it right now, but you don't. Right. So we knew I loved the sport. And then he asked me, this is your timeline. Are you willing to come along for that ride? Whatever it looks like, whatever the outcome, get rid of the outcome, but know that this is what this year looks like. This is what next year looks like. This is what the year after that looks like. Are you willing to join me on this, this ride? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, why wouldn't I be? I love weightlifting and I know I don't yeah. want to go without it. So why don't I just take each year for what it's supposed to be instead of trying yeah. to rush this process? Right. And I'll tell you what, dude, the second I did that, I had been fighting for four years to try and make a podium spot for second or third on a yeah. national level. 
could not do it. I couldn't place higher than eighth. I placed mm -hmm. eighth. There's two national meets a year, every single one. So that's one, two, three, four, five times. I, pl I placed eighth place in the country. Couldn't uh, break it. Yeah. The second I stopped caring about my outcome and just started going, these are the days in front of me. This is what I need to do today. This is what I need to do this month. This is what I have to do this year. And yeah. literally just focusing on the immediate. I went to a national meet and I took third place. Wow. Holy yeah. shit. And I cried, dude. And yeah. that's what I'm, that's what I was talking about earlier when I found something that challenges me that I have to fight for. And that long haul fight makes it just taste so much better when you accomplish yeah. what you're out to accomplish. Yeah. But you have to, you have to assess your expectations. Moral mm -hmm. of the story, be realistic with your expectations. And I think this is where a lot of people, whether it's nutrition, whether it's something in the gym after two weeks, they're like, well, I haven't lost any weight or I don't all of a sudden have abs from yeah. all the sit-ups I've been doing. I'm throwing my hands in the air and I'm trying something else. Yeah. Assess your expectations. Yeah. This stuff takes time. I've been doing this. People ask me now, like, oh my gosh, your physique is, is so nice. Like what, what do you do? And it's like, well, where do you want me to start? Right. I've been in the gym for 10 years. Right. February so, 12th, 1992. <laughs> They're like, no, no, I no. came out the womb doing bicep curls with my umbilical cord. Right. No, I just, uh, yeah, I think that that was a big, big lesson for me. And that's, mm. I, I think maybe this conversation just now made me realize that that's something I think we all could, um, could kind of listen to and, and like take mm -hmm. away and reflect on is, are you being unrealistic with your expectations? And is that why you're frustrated? Yeah. I, and I think, that's so true no matter what you're doing, whether it's with, with business, whether it's with finances, whether it's with uh, weight training, weight loss, whatever it might be. I think that's the biggest thing because uh, we all say, right, like we all say like when we start something like, yeah, I know I'm not going it, to it, – it's going to be slow, right? I know it, like progress is slow. I get that, yeah. sure. Then you're yeah. like six months into you're like – why am I not at my goal yet? Right. It's like it's, I didn't know it was this slow. <laughs> That's right. So it's a uh, I, I think and I think it is like um I think the people who get it are the ones who allow themselves to sort of be humbled. Right. It's like when you when you allow yourself to be humbled by the progress and and the process and all that, kind of like you said, you get to a place in your head where it's like, well, I know that this this daily thing I do is going to contribute to that goal. I know that this contributes to my goal. This contributes to my goal. So if I keep doing X, Y, and Z, I'll eventually get there, right? But I'm not going to set a timeline on when I'll get there. I just know I will get there, right? And yeah. I think that's kind of like the mindset you adopted too. Is like, all right, like I need to do this and I'm going to do this anyways because I do enjoy it. I need to tamper my own shit because I'm a born again winner. <laughs> you know, it's and you're really like, if you think about it, you're very new to winning too, right? Like it's it's like in the last like 10 years, right? You're just like, oh, winning's fun. Like this is this yeah. is just what it is. You know, it's like and it almost it almost gave me that um I don't know if we have a term for it, but we should. Mm -hmm. The um the participation trophy syndrome. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Like everybody gets a trophy, even if you didn't win. And I'm right. going to be honest, I don't fucking agree with that. Right, right. Sure. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you need to earn it. You need to earn it. You have to earn your paycheck, right? Yep. So earn your damn trophy. And if you didn't earn a trophy, that's fine. Yeah. Assess where you can grow in whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. whether it's you're, you're trying to earn a bonus check at work or you're trying to earn a, a medal or a trophy or, or whatever. It's okay to lose. It's yeah. okay to lose. Yeah. Look at what went wrong and where you can grow. How can you be better? Right. What can you change? Yep. But I had so many years of win, 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 win that once I got to Olympic weightlifting, I was like, okay, this will, again, this will take some time. Yeah. And I'm thinking one, two years. And then when I didn't get my little trophy after two years, I was all pouting in the corner. Like, yeah. where's my participation trophy? Right. Why aren't we going to Dairy Queen? Yes. <laughs> I want to celebrate something. Where's my free ice cream? <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so true. It's okay to lose. It's mm -hmm. really okay. Yeah. And I Use think it. it. It's definitely okay to lose. And I think it's also, I think what helps sort of allows you to swallow losing a little bit better is is finding those wins on your own too, right? Like for you to be able to say like, hey, this is a sport I just started three years ago and I've just finished top 10 in the nation, right? Like that's, I think sort of reframing 
your yeah. experience helps a lot too, right? Because I think so often it's so easy for us to say, I only finished eight split. It's like the same people say, I only lost five pounds or anything like that. Or like, I only lifted 135 pounds. Like, motherfucker, you just finished top 10, right? In the nation, you just started this year. Or it's like, you just lost five pounds. You know how much five pounds is when you actually look at it? It's like- Yeah, but, that visual. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's 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 also helps. It makes losing easier when you find your own wins, right? So it's like the wins and the losses that help you sort of, keep going right and totally and not make it such a negative bitter process another thing that really helped me to um to make you know taking a loss not a negative or a, or a bitter process as mm -hmm. you were saying is um when i went into that that competition in december where i took third place yeah i went into that competition with one goal and only yeah. one goal and it was to beat the person that I was at my July competition because mm. I almost bombed out of that competition, meaning I almost didn't post a total and I would have been disqualified. Oh, it was wow. the, it was the worst meet I've had ever. And it, the crazy thing is that it, it's the worst meet to date. There will be one that is worse. And right. I know that, right. but I'm accepting of that now. But I went into that, the, the December competition telling myself your one goal is to beat who you were back in July. Right. And that doesn't even mean numbers. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to show up with a different attitude and a different mindset. Mm -hmm. And the second that I had those blinders on and all I was doing was trying to be better than the person I was yesterday, I made myself the biggest competition, not anybody else in the room. Yeah. Sure, I'm competing against them. But the reality is I have no control over their variables. Mm-hmm. I only have control over my variables. So when I stopped comparing myself to other people um, at an Olympic level, right, trying to get to where they are and, and do it faster than they do, or whether it's an immediate competition or whether it's me just doing a daily training session in the gym, like yeah. I'm cheering on <clears throat> the people next to me, but I'm not comparing myself to them right. because it does me no service. If I show up every day and try to be 1% better than I was yesterday, whether it's a technique thing, whether it's a mental state, whether it's more weight on the bar, I'm going to get better every single day. And right. if I keep doing that, I can outpace some of the other people. Right. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Right. I'm not paying attention to them, to right. be honest. Right. And it, it was a big, it was a refreshing breath of air because again, like it just made it more fun for me. Yeah. And then also happened to bring me these results that I had been seeking. Mm, yeah. But yeah. stay in, stay in your damn lane. Stay in your lane. <laughs> and I think, I, yeah, I think that is important. <laughs> that was the horn beat. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I think, I think that's true. I think as soon as you, and like I said, I've definitely can put myself in the comparison mindset to before. And it's, like whether it's with business, you're like, holy shit, I started this and they're already here, but you know, and it's so easy to to get lost there, right? And it is it's just such a negative place to be, right? Because it's always you, you almost downplay all the things you've been doing and you it's never enough, right? And even your little victories almost like they're like fail in comparison compared to somebody else's victories. Like you see someone else winning, kind of like you said, someone else sees the way you look and all that, they're like, Well, you know, I'll, I, why, why should I even start? Cause like, they've been doing this for so long or, you know, they, they've seen so much success. Like why, why do I deserve that? Or how can I, I, I'll never get there. Right. So I think that comparison mindset is super, super important. Yeah. It can be, it can be detrimental. So you mm -hmm. have to watch out for it. You got to keep it in healthy doses. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was going to ask you about like your, your, your body work stuff and your physical th therapies and stuff, but you know, we, we have like 10 minutes left. So I guess <laughs> we, a good combo for all. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, guess, um, I mean, I can, I can briefly. Yeah. Give so, us a briefing. Like yeah, how'd you okay. get started in that? And then that's a great story. I have, I have a specific, some questions that we can go over and then we'll wrap it up. Specific. Okay. So Four years ago, I got my degree as a physical therapy assistant, worked mm -hmm. in corporate healthcare for two years. And again, there would be times, um, maybe I had a high functioning patient and, uh, at an athlete, right. A mm -hmm. high school athlete with an injury and insurance says, well, can they do this, this, and this, 
okay, then they don't need therapy anymore. Mm. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute. This kid's an athlete. He can't throw a ball. Right. And they're like, well, not our problem. He's done. Yeah. And wow. I just, I just, I saw a big problem with that. So um, that's when I started my LLC. And as I said, I moved out to California, basically went full time yeah. with my LLC. And that's my goal now. I mainly work on athletes, but I do have some like general population people that see me. Um, I'm known for my deep tissue. Yep. <laughs> but <laughs> yep, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, speaking, I only saw you once, right? I know, you know? Back soon. <laughs> but um, I do have some of the general population people, they call them fluff and buffs. Mm. Um, they're like, Can I just have a nice massage? Like, can you right. not do yeah. You're like, so uh, sometimes, You're looking at your hands. Yeah, like, oh. I'm like, uh. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, my, my goal is just to help people achieve their goals. Mm. I've had, I've got a guy right now, he has a hard time putting his socks on. He's like, I want my hips to be mobile enough. I can put my socks on in the morning. Mm. Done. Let's get you there. Yeah. And then I've got athletes. I just had somebody competing at the Arnold um, for his first pro debut. And he's like, I got to hit this on squat bench deadlift. I'm having some shoulder pain and some lower back pain. I'm like, mm. I got you. Yeah. Let's get you those numbers, you know? So my goal, I absorb whatever my client's goal is. Yeah. But um, that's how that grew. And um how I got into that was actually back when I was powerlifting, I was doing a sumo deadlift and pulled my back like mm. bad. I, I went to the emergency room because I thought I blew out a disc. Wow. Um, I was having pretty bad spasms. And long story short, that took me out of lifting, pulling anything for about six months. Oh, wow. It was a pretty, pretty bad tear in my back. Um, and I rehabbed it myself. And through that process, I realized one, that I was very capable of that. Like how, mm -hmm. how I realized how much knowledge I had about biomechanics and anatomy right? and, um, that I was pretty good at it really. And the other thing was, I just knew the feeling that, that completely lost feeling of being taken out of the one thing that I loved. Mm -hmm. I loved lifting and all I wanted to do was get back to it. And I just felt so lost and so helpless and so frustrated and rehabbing it and being able to come back to it and then come back stronger than I was before, smarter yeah. than I was before. That was so powerful. And I was like, if I can spread this to other people, that's what I want to do. Mm. So that's what led me into a career in, in physical therapy. Wow. And, I, and it's so funny because I think uh, any any person I know who's in the business of whether it's physical therapy, whether it's chiropractic, whether it's um, massage therapy or stretch therapy, whatever it might be. I think everybody had that uh, I'm, I'm injured moment. How can I heal this? And also they faced like sort of um, how corporate handles injury, like yeah. how insurance handles injuries. And I think every, every, and these are the people I want to go see to get treated, right? Like I'm not trying to go see the chiropractor is like, oh, you're misaligned in your jaw. That's what's causing your knee. But no, it's like, I'm not trying to see you. I'm not trying to see you three times a week for the next six months. Not, I right. want the person who understands that, you know, there's, there are flaws in our healthcare system when it comes to treating injuries and, and recovery and all that stuff. And that they're, they've been there too, right? Where they've, they've been like, I've been injured and all these things. And I understand, um, the process it takes to come back from it. And also there's different methodologies and being open to different methodologies that can help. So I think yeah. those are always the people I seek out whenever I'm injured because, um, yeah, because I've, I've been, you know, scorned by, uh, the insurance industry too. And I used to, I tore my hamstring in high school twice. I tore my shoulder labor room, which you worked on a little bit in our session. Like, I've had tons of injuries, so I, I, I understand that completely. Um, to wrap it up, mm -hmm. uh, so the name of this podcast is called These Little Moments Podcast, and the reason I named it this podcast is because I had a uh, a moment in my life where I was having extreme anxiety, extreme depression. I went to this fitness conference, and for the first time I've ever told anybody, I decided to tell everybody I was struggling with my mental health in front of like a group of like 50 plus people for whatever <laughs> reason. I just felt compelled to do it. All right. And, and that was a big little moment in my life that really changed my own mental health, my own health in general, and how I coach people a lot too. Um, what was a little moment in your life that you can look back and say like, wow, thank God this happened because it led me to be 
the person I am today. Ooh, this is going to be so deep. Okay. That's why I ask it. <laughs> I'm all about the, the laughs and the sadness combined. <laughs> yeah. And this is definitely both. And people who are listening are going to be like, that's not laughable, <laughs> but I can laugh about it now. Yeah. Um, so this doesn't come up often just because I don't think it's a topic that comes up often. I'm not mm -hmm. shy to talk about it at all, mm -hmm. but I was actually in an abusive relationship as an adult. This was maybe five years ago mm -hmm. or so. Um, and being in that relationship, anybody who has been in an abusive relationship, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, once you get out of it, you can look back and you're like, holy shit, like who, mm. who was I? Like what happened to me? Because that's, that's what happens is you completely lose yourself. Yeah, You're gone. You're not there anymore. Um, and I remember once I, you know, got out of that relationship and had some time away from it and time to reflect, I realized, and actually I forget whose kid said this to me, but it was a toddler and it was so funny. He goes, he was messing with me. He goes, you're so physically strong because you're very emotionally weak. Oh, wow. And I was like, Breaks you down. damn kid. <laughs> you know what? He was right though. Yeah. He was right. I just, um, it was, that was, it was so true. I was so physically strong because there was something inside of me that was so broken and so weak. Yeah. And, um, it was after that relationship that was a that was a big little moment like that mm. whole relationship lasted 2 years it was awful and then leaving that relationship i learned how to set boundaries mm -hmm. i learned how to value myself mm -hmm. um and i learned how to have mental and emotional strength and integrity mm. and while I would never wish an abusive relationship on anybody, yeah. I came I came out of that thing a fucking warrior. Yeah. And it's 100% why I am who I am today. Mm. Um, It just, it like I said, it taught me these values that I think I knew all along because I, I had great parents growing up. Um, yeah. So it's not like they failed to teach me these things. I think I just never implemented them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure how you teach someone how to implement those things. Yeah. But that relationship, leaving that relationship was step one. Like that yeah. was the, the, me stepping out of that was the first moment of mental grit. Mm. And I was like, okay, if I can do this, I can pretty much do anything. Yeah. And I will never, I will never stoop to those levels again. And I will never allow the small, manipulations mm. to occur because they add up and that's how you get lost in that black hole of like holy shit how did i get here and how the hell right. do i get out right and, and that, who am i yeah that was my big little moment i i found who i was mentally emotionally um and just at my core who i am once i left that relationship wow. and it's been the best like five years of my life since then wow. and that. every day is just grow grow more yeah yeah. whether it's physically right, right. We, we ain't scared of that now, right, now right. How, how big can we get right, exactly. um, whether it's physically or um perfect example three weeks ago i started therapy and some of my wow, friends are like go. why what's wrong what's going on and i'm like nothing i want to grow like i'm sure yeah. there's some shit that we can break down yeah you know she's, she's already asking about my family history and everything yeah yeah Putting all those Freudian pieces together yeah but yeah no it's just why why would you not just like in the gym, you're trying to grow physically. Why would you yeah. not continue to to grow mentally, emotionally, spiritually, yeah. whatever that means or looks like for you? Mm -hmm. um, like life is short, but it's not stagnant. All right. Yeah. So, so true. Grow. Yeah. Grow. I love that. And, I, and I'm such a big and I appreciate you sharing that. And it's and super yeah. thing. A lot of people will resonate with that. And I think a lot of people appreciate your vulnerability. I know I do. And I think the... I'm such a huge proponent of therapy. It's it's something I started doing. Same thing. I had a, I didn't have a toddler tell me. I had some complete random stranger who went to the gym I worked at come up to me and say, "Hey, I can tell you're going through a lot of shit. Uh, just want you to know it's going to be okay." And I'm just like, I hadn't even told anybody what I was struggling. I'm like, you could just see this shit. I'm like, you could feel this shit. So that was and that was me. I like and I broke down from that too. And that's what got me 
back into therapy and, and sort of being like, all right, well, guess what? You can bench press a lot of weight, but you can get a lot of shit to work through uh, that you really need to work on. Right. And I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, I, I think a lot of people specifically in fitness industry and all that stuff, I think that's another lesson for everyone to learn is like, Hey, no matter how strong you're on the outside, like there's always, you know, something to work on the inside to get you there too. And it should match up just as physically strong as you are. Um, but I appreciate Outer you. and inner strength. Yeah. 1000%. But I appreciate you. Thanks for being on the podcast. See, Thanks I told for you, having we, just, me. we talk and chit chat and shit just happens. <laughs> we just shoot the shit and throw some hay bales around. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, no, you got to run, but I appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, where can people find you? Um, so I have two Instagram accounts. I have my lifting Instagram account, which is um, at Darcy, that's D-A-R-C-I underscore Mo, M-O. And then my business account where you can find a lot of how-to videos mm -hmm. on wellness, health, mobility, tips, tricks like that. Um, that is going to be at D, the letter D, period, Mo, M-O, underscore wellness. Awesome. Sweet. Well, make sure everybody check out where she's at. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome.